Do you know how to communicate effectively? Communication lies at the heart of all relationships. Personal relationships, business relationships, family relationships. Because it's the way we interact with each other. But do we know how to communicate in a healthy way? We live in a world today where communications through technology, through marketing, through sales, through advertising, inundates us. In many ways, it desensitizes us to the true power of communication because someone's trying to sell you something. So it's time to revisit and let's look at the secret to healthy communication. Please join me and we will review the few steps necessary to build healthy, enduring, empowering relationships. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson. Welcome. We will be discussing the secret to healthy communication. This program is dedicated by Dina Rachel Fisher in loving memory of her beloved parents, Jack and Nadia, on the 3rd and 16th of Tammuz. May their neshamas have an aliyah. The secret to healthy communication. So let's first begin with what is communication and its importance. It lies at the heart of all relationships, personal relationships, romantic relationships, intimate relationships, friendships, family relationships, business relationships. Wherever two people are interacting, there's some form of communication. Even silence is communication. So really is the key to the bond, to the bridge between two individuals. Look at the crisis we have in communication today. The polarization. Two people have different opinions. They can't even communicate with each other. They can't talk to each other. I'm not saying it across the board. There are many, there are many that can. So there's clearly issues at hand. You see people in divorce court, in other courts, fighting. Why can't they communicate and come to some happy medium, some resolution, some compromise? Why is there war and conflict altogether? So I know it sounds like a naive and almost childish question. I understand there are different opinions, and when there are strong opinions, those opinions will clash to the point of tensions, to the point of conflict. But is it possible to perhaps go back to the heart and essence of what is communication in the first place? And if we revisit it properly, we can come away with a whole way, another way of looking at ourselves and the world around us and those around us and the people around us. And perhaps we could improve and higher the standard. I say perhaps, but I really mean I absolutely believe we can. But we have to begin with the actual concept of a relationship. Let's begin from the beginning. Where is the first place in our lives where we communicate? The first time ever that you communicate with someone. Well, it's in your mother's womb. Your mother is communicating to you, and I'm sure the fetus is communicating back to the mother. And what does the communication consist of? It could be words, a mother speaking to her developing new child, but it's communication that's even more than words. It's through the embrace, the very fact that a child is developing in a womb, a fetus is developing, it's completely embraced, engulfed, in the embryonic waters, fluids, in a nurturing way. So the first message we receive in our lives is nurturing. Even if the parent may be dysfunctional, but as long as the pregnancy is a healthy one, it's a nurturing. So what do you see from that? That the first relationship we have is one of nurturing. Just like you water a flower, we're all nurtured and loved and embraced those nine months. 
So that's, you can say, in a more superconscious or unconscious manner. Or subconscious. I like the word superconscious. Because not, it's not in this basement, in the sub. It's in the above, beyond consciousness. But then the child is born and the communication continues. It can be through words like, I love you. Again, through actions. So we see the earliest communication we have in our lives is actually very different than what we become familiar with as we grow into, grow into adults. Because let's now take it to the other extreme. What is the communication we're most accustomed to? Well, especially in our world today, sales, marketing, advertising, someone's pitching you, and not always bad, could be great. And it's an entire billion dollar, if not trillion dollar industry, how to sell something, how to convince someone, how to influence someone, how to get, gain an investment, how to gain customers, clients. So communication is all around us. And it inundates us. But if you start contrast, contrasting it to the earliest times of communication, it's a very different type of communication. That is why we don't trust easily. Because we look around and we see someone always wants something from us. It could be through manipulation. Even if it's good intentions, emotional manipulation. The words that are used, the images that are used. This is all communication being used and it could be misused and, abu- and abused. So you see how important this topic is, because what is, what is communication? Which really the question is, what is a relationship? So let's go back to my case study, or to the back to the beginning, which I always consider to be the healthy template of how we were born and how we learned to communicate. So a new child is being, now has been born. It listens to its parents, to its siblings, to the sounds around it, hopefully in a healthy home. There will be nurturing messages, validation, confirmation, love. And as the child begins to actually listen to all of this, it begins to communicate as well. Whether it's the first cry or the first laughter, the first word, all that cuteness that we find in children as they begin to speak and then develop language. All that is laying the groundwork of what this child is going to be. So who you are today And how you communicate or how you don't communicate is based on how you were communicated to and how you communicated in turn at your earliest stages in life. And if you you can create a, uh, a, 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 a juxtapose and create like a comparison between where we were and where we are today, in other words, how it began our communication in our lives and where we are today, you will find mind blowing and many times disturbing contrasts. But that's the way we work. We have no other choice. We have to look at what we have now and then compare it to a more pure or more perfect template. And that's what the purpose of this discussion is about. So I want to identify the key elements of the healthy communication from early stages in life and how we can now regain and reclaim it in our lives today, whether if we don't have it yet completely. I'm not suggesting that you or I don't communicate at all well. I'm sure all of us have our moments where we really communicate in a very great way. But we all know how communication breaks down and relationships suffer as a result. So it's always good to look at it and not just take for granted and say, oh, you're a great communicator. Many people I ask, are you a good communicator? Yeah, I'm a great communicator. You ask their spouse. He can't communicate at all. He doesn't listen to me. He doesn't know how to reach me. Etc., etc. So it's always healthy to look at it and revisit it, which is what we're doing. So here are the few key elements. And some of them are actually counterintuitive. But I'm going to take it from the contrast again by looking at what bad communication is about. And you could always see it in its results. If, if communication that's bad is going to not create any productive results. If anything, it can be alienating, even create hostility. Definitely not a bond. So if you think of it, communication is about creating a bond. Unhealthy com- healthy communication is about creating healthy bonds. Unhealthy communication is creating a split, a schism. If I feel that I can't trust you, 
if I feel that you're trying to do something, take advantage of me, or I just don't feel that you really care, that you're not connecting with me. So communication is about connection, about healthy attachments, healthy connection. And as I said at the outset, it's not only about words. Everybody thinks communication is what words you use. It's a big part of it. We are called speakers. We speak to each other. We communicate with each other. But communication is also body language. It's also what you don't do. It's also the silence. When you read words on a page, it's not just the words. There's also the space between the words, between the letters, between the lines, between chapters. So the spaces between our words are also vital, just as the cadence in music. So too, com cadence in communication. Song and music is also communication. A smile is communication. So if you think of it in that way, it's generally the general relationship and the choice and the, the option, the two options, the two choices we have, is it going to be healthy or unhealthy? So the unhealthy version, you can just look around and see it quite quickly. You see how people take advantage of each other. You see how people abuse one another. Sometimes it can be a superior and their subordinate. Command each other, demand. Sometimes you get what you want because a person needs to if you pay somebody. But you'll see good leaders are great communicators. They're not just demanding and then forcing you to do something because you have to. They inspire you to do it. Now, in good marketing, they can do that as well. So that also can be manipulated. But I'm not going to go through every po possible interaction we have. That I think you can, each of us can apply. So let's now look at the healthy version. So I would begin with the first and most important thing, that good communication is good listening. Not what you say, but how you listen. You're speaking to someone. So you think you have to impress them. You have to inspire them. That may be part of it. But the first and most important step is listening, meaning getting yourself out of the way and listening to another. Where are their needs? What are their interests? You say, one second, isn't that I need to tell them my needs and my interests? I'm not saying there isn't a time for that. But if you want to build a connection, the first thing in any connection is that it's not about me. Like the guy that goes on a date, and in two hours he speaks about himself, and then he turns to the woman and says, okay, enough about me. Now what do you think about me? That's not good communication, because it's not a connection. There's no attachment there. That's about narcissism. It's about self. It's about you imposing yourself or trying to impress or trying to perform. You're performing. Communication is that there's another and your recognition of another. The Kabbalists, especially the Ariza, in his doctrine is called the secret doctrine of the Tzimtzum, where God, the divine presence, conceals itself in order to allow space for another. That is called listening. You're creating space for another. That's the first. In the, the Hebrew Hasidic terminology for it is bittel. Okay. The second thing is care, empathy. That you care about the person, you care about the subject matter. Great line, I'm not sure who coined it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And this is in one-on-one -on -one communication or public communication, public speaking. When they feel empathy, you feel you care about my condition, about the human condition, about life. It opens up the heart, which leads me to, you could say it's an ext by extension, the concept of words from the heart enter the heart. Words from the brain go into one ear and out the other. They may stay with you if you, if you hear a tip, but there's nothing like words from the heart because a heart responds to a heart so those are the first two things when we talk about empathy and, and listening the next is empowerment the communication is empowerment remember I mentioned before a mother empowers her child through the nurturing communication of either providing for the child in actions in words, in a smile, it's empowerment. The other person feels stronger after they speak with you. They feel more able to achieve what they have to achieve. Now you'll notice I haven't yet mentioned anything about your needs. You could say one second, what about my needs? We'll get to that. But remember, we're talking about communication as connection. You want to make a connection. I remember giving a workshop 
a public speaking workshop about how to communicate with individuals. People who are in public positions, community leaders, rabbis, educators, influencers. And I opened up a question. I said, if you had 30 minutes with a group of people, that the first time they, they see you, the first time you see them, you have only 30 minutes. You don't know if they will ever return to your community, to your sphere. What do you want to accomplish in those 30 minutes? And I, we went around the room, and people said interesting things. One person said, I'd like to inspire them, I'd like them to say something that they will want to come back. One person, whether it was half humorous or serious, said, I'd like a donation. But the main point was to be, I said, let's be honest. What, what would you want to accomplish? And everything they said were, were legitimate, was legitimate. But I, I added one, one word. And I said, what you want is trust. Establish trust. And I saw everybody nod. But no one said it, because you don't think of it that way. Establish trust. And trust can be bought. It has to be earned. The question, of course, is how you establish trust. But you want to establish trust. You have 30 minutes. Because once there's trust, first of all, people will give you the benefit of the doubt. Secondly, it opens up a person. Because everyone has their defenses up all the time. I don't necessarily mean heavy layers of armor. Some people have that too. But everyone has, when you meet someone for the first time, and I'm talking about the first time, you don't know who it is. So we all have a certain defensive mechanisms. And not unhealthy necessarily. It's, it's, a, it's a form of protection. It's also a form of, let me check it out. I need to do my due diligence before I let you in. Before I... I allow myself to be vulnerable, to be receptive. And if it's healthy, you will open up if you do feel trust. But if you don't feel trust, you won't. You won't want to connect. So trust lies at the heart. And that's why I go back to the child. A newborn child or a child that's in the, in the, in the womb is learning trust. Because every second, 24-7, is being fed and being given oxygen and everything it needs. That implants in the child a trust that someone will protect me, that I am not alone in this world. I understand I'm talking on a more cosmic or broader level, but let's bring it back to regular communications. Trust is what you want to establish. The question is how? And the answer is, I go back to the other first two things, that people see you're capable of listening, even though you're doing the speaking. But I can tell you as a speaker, speaking is listening. Even though no one else may be saying words, but you pick up the vibes. So it's a listening to the human condition. It's a sensitivity to life. And that is expressed when you share. If you get up there and start preaching an idea that came to you, yeah, you may say something interesting, but it's not from the heart. The empathy. Well, let me go back. The listening, that you understand the human condition. You're addressing an issue and you say, you know, recently I had a setback in my life. And I'm not saying that in a way, in a, in, a, in a manipulative way. You're sharing a personal experience. That immediately creates trust because people say, ah, you know what, I can identify with this person. He identifies with me or she identifies with me. So listening and empathy go hand in hand in that sense because empathy means you care about me. You care about what, what, I'm, what I care about. It's not how much you know. It's how much you care. As I said before, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And once trust is established, it could be 30 minutes. You may never see them again, but something has happened. More likely, you will see them again. So trust is ultimately a key component in all of this. Now, so we've talked about, let's just sum it up so far. We've talked about listening, talked about care, empathy, talked about empowerment, that you're here to empower, you help somebody grow. And we talked about trust. But let's talk about a few other points, which really are an extension, but it's the, same, it's the same spirit of it all. But above all, keep in mind, it's all about the connection you're making. Now, I'll be honest, there are people in marketing classes and marketing techniques, I know because I've approached to offer a marketing workshop. This is marketing at its best. But not marketing in a way, and that brings me to my next step, is integrity and sincerity. Because you can use these methods also to sell garbage, to manipulate someone. 
to sell them something that's not even valuable. There are people who can engender and cultivate trust because they know how to manipulate. So obviously, we need to have an element of integrity and honesty. And that's not always, the listener may not be able to always pick it up. I know people are great con artists. That's what makes a con artist a great con artist. They know how to manipulate your emotions. They know how to replicate and emulate everything I said, but not really, because it's ultimately not going to last. But it's important to keep in mind that as a communicator, there is an element of sincerity. And I would say that when you say words from the heart enter the heart, yes, I've seen people who are con artists can pull that off. But as Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people all the time. You can fool all the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. Are there people that can be manipulated? Yes, but that's not what we're discussing. This is not the art of manipulation. This is the art of communication, the secret of healthy communication, with the emphasis on healthy. So sincerity, integrity, what you're offering, do you believe in it? Do you really believe in the product? doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Many talks I give, many classes I give, people ask me, you believe everything you say? Do you do everything you say? I say, to do everything I say? That's the whole point of a standard, of an ideal. It's always more than what you're doing. But I believe in the product. I believe in its potential. I believe that it's something worthy of aspiring to. And if you don't, you shouldn't be sharing. You shouldn't be talking about it. Put it bluntly. And if you're hired to sell something, or you're hired to market or to communicate it, and you don't believe in it, I understand you may need the money, but you have to ask yourself, is this really worth your life? Now, I know we live in a world where people are told, sell something even though it doesn't matter. You force yourself to believe in it. But in the work I do, which is not, we're not selling cars, we're not selling real estate, or cooking tips, where the information is the most important thing, we're talking about methodology of how to live your life. Which leads me to a few other points I want to address in, in, the, in the secret of healthy communication. Methodology. It goes back to the empowerment. You're not teaching people data and information. You're not communicating that. You're empowering people and you want to teach them methodology. So if we take all the above and combine them, the space you create for another... That means there's the room for, there's that channel that has been opened up. A channel, a bridge, which is the heart of it all, which in turn creates the trust we spoke about. And all the other elements, the empathy, the empowerment, all of that combines, if you think about it, about a real connection, a real attachment, a true relationship. Because that's what communication is about. Unfortunately, when we live in a material world, that's not the unfortunate that we live in a material world. But unfortunately, a byproduct of materialism is selfishness. My communication is about me, about what I need, what I want from you. And now I have to convince you to give me something. Your time, your money, your energy. But when life is built on understanding that it's about love and about spiritual connections, and the material is only a means to an end, then the whole communication changes. Then the goal is two souls to interact, to commune, kindred spirits. That whoever you meet is an opportunity here. That's more than just a business opportunity. It's a spiritual opportunity. So though business has to be, transactions have to be transacted, business, the show must go on as they say, but why not infuse it with deeper levels of communication, deeper levels of trust? The problem is when we divorce the two, where, you know, my healthy communication is with people I love on weekends, evenings, but at work, we're sharks swimming with other sharks, and it's tough negotiations. We're not talking about unethical now. Tough, you don't need to show empathy, you don't need to show care. I submit that that's not necessarily the case. I'm not suggesting one shouldn't be a good business person. One shouldn't communicate effectively in a way, express your needs. Let me hear your needs and let's find a way to communicate, that could connect together. But it could always be infused with something deeper, which is the whole purpose, ultimately, of communication is true relationships. Healthy ones, sustainable ones. Now, obviously, there's a difference between a personal, romantic or intimate relationship and communication 
one with family than one at work. But they have some things in common. And if we can integrate the, the elements. So I'm not suggesting every stranger has to become son of your family. But if we can integrate and bring these principles that I've been talking about, the trust, the space, the listening, the empathy, the empowerment, the integrity, even into our workplace, we change the world. No question about it. So though we have all the technologies available to us and all the communications, all you need is a smartphone and you're connected, but these connections are up to us how we're going to use them. Will we infuse them with a higher standard? Let's call it the soul of communication. Soulfulness. And it doesn't take away from the practical part. Obviously, we understand sometimes communication is on a shallow or superficial level. You're asking someone what time it is or how to get to the subway or how to travel somewhere or what, was your, what is your opinion about something. Look, we have talk radio. <laughs> we have talk shows. We have podcasts. People are talking, talking, talking. But the end of the day is how you go away from it. Is it building trust? Is it building deeper connections? Is it helping our psyches grow? Is it becoming more loving? That is the question that you have to always ask yourself. And that is critical, not just in the personal relationships we have, but in all relationships. Because that's what a real communication is. It's about building healthy connections. So with that, my friends, I hope I was able to communicate effectively here. I obviously work at this all the time of trying to speak from the heart. And you can tell me if it enters the heart. And hopefully you can use some of these tools in your own communications. Try it out. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Try it out. Try it out with your families. Try it out with others. And then a final note about if there's a disagreement. These principles will tr bring tremendous ways to deal with a disagreement. You disagree with someone, let's say it's a standing a, a argument where you have agreed to disagree. Try out. Come back to that person and say, listen, I know it's a topic, a sore topic. It's, I know it opens up a Pandora's box. It's, uh, it opens up, uh, it touches a nerve. Let me listen to you. I want to hear what you have to say. And the same with the other principles that I pointed out. The empathy, the care, the empowerment, the building of trust. And let me know how it goes. I would love to hear your feedback. If we can create this type of like grassroots ripple effect, imagine how we can change the world. There's only a few degrees, what do they say, five degrees of separation between us. And in many ways, this is my mission, our mission, is to create better relationships, is to create healthier communication, healthier bridges and connections. So again, I'd love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your comments. And please share this with others. Be blessed and be well. Communicate well. Connect well. May we build that type of vast network, a network of harmony within diversity where we're all indispensable musical notes in the large cosmic symphony. And those notes communicate with each other. They both know how to speak and to listen. They know when to speak and when to listen. When to play and when to let the other play. And that is not just def deferring, but it's actually complementing and realizing that we are far greater, our synergy, greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you so much. This has been Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. Please check us out. And again, love to hear from you. And please share. Thank you. Be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.